Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast, the podcast dedicated to simplifying the commercial real estate industry for the masses. Each week, we sit down with industry experts to dissect the many facets of commercial real estate and extract valuable lessons you can apply to your business. Whether you're a new or seasoned business owner or investor, the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast will be your go-to resource for all your commercial real estate needs. Now, here are your hosts, Rafael Collazo and Jeff Walston. Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast. I'm your host, Rafa Coyasso, here with my co-host, Jeff Walston. How's it going, my friend? It is going wonderful. Uh, towards the end of the week, I'm excited for the weekend. Um, business is great. You know, 2022 uh, is looking more promising every single day. Uh, hopefully, everyone else feels the same way and not uh, still freaking out for pandemic and all these other issues, and uh, especially what's going on in the world. But anyways... I'm just excited, um, especially about the podcast, but how's it going on for you, bud? Good, man. Good. Um, you know, just trying to keep on top of a lot of things, you know, it's been a busy last couple of weeks and, you know, the springtime is here and the, the flowers are starting to bloom a bit and my grass is starting to grow. So I'm going to have to get out there at some point to deal with that, but, uh, no, it's been, it's been good so far. And, you know, speaking of just a, a great conversation and, and just a awesome person that we were able to meet through this podcast. And that's one of the cool things about the, the podcast is we get to meet so many cool people. And uh, oh, yeah. today was no different. Uh, we actually met uh, Vinny DeMeglio. He's a senior vice president at JLL in New Jersey, in Princeton, New Jersey, to be to be exact, or near Princeton, New Jersey, I should say. And so uh, we got to talk to him about a variety of different topics. And, uh, you know, a lot of them were pertaining to the office market, and in particular, the office market where he is currently located. So to start off, what we did, we talked a little bit about his background. You know, he he started his career in, in 2009 uh, timeframe and has been in the commercial real estate brokerage business since then. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the early struggles that he faced in his career and, you know, some of the some of the advice he would have for younger brokers that are looking to kind of scale in their career and and just be effective and, and, and become those top performers over a period of time. We talked about some of the lease deals that he's working on and how he's seeing the market evolve. Uh, you know, again, we're as at the time of this recording, we're, we're currently in March of 2022, you know, about two years removed from the start of the pandemic. And so he's starting to see, you know, more activity as far as people starting to you know, want to execute these office and lease deals. And so, you know, we talked a little bit about what he's been seeing in the marketplace as it pertains to that. And then finally, we, we kind of rounded out the, the podcast to talk about a little bit about uh, his digital marketing efforts and some of the value that he's been generating as a result of him being heavily engaged in, in, in LinkedIn. And he actually started out on the blogging side. Um, and so some of the value that he received from those experiences and how he was able to actually land a pretty sizable deal uh, from his, you know, digital efforts and obviously meeting this gentleman person, but the digital effort is what really sealed the deal for him uh, when it came to that. So again, I, I found the uh, conversation extremely enlightening. He is a fellow Italian. And for those of you guys who are listening, I'm actually half Italian myself. So we kind of chopped it up at the beginning, uh, you know, about uh, our Italian roots, which is kind of cool to do. So yeah, Jeff, do you have anything else you like to add? Uh, I like that uh, Benny was mentioning like some of the trends that he seems in his office space uh, sector of the, the U S um, just what they're doing um, to bring people back in and also kind of dove into like, not everyone can spend a million uh, to get uh, their employees happy, but they can do little things here and there. And I like that he uh, touched base on that. So that was a really nice part of it, but Benny uh, all around good guy. So can't wait for you to listen to the podcast. No, for sure. No, I couldn't agree more. And and I think, like you said, the, the equilibrium point that's going to eventually be achieved when it comes to the tenants and the landlords is definitely something to, to keep in mind and something we do discuss during the podcast episode. So now before before we dive in, uh, what I what I do uh, want to say is thank you guys so much for everything you guys have done uh, through the podcast. I mean, your guys' impact and, and engagement with for the podcast has been truly amazing. Uh, what I do wish and, and ask you guys to do is to potentially leave a five-star review. We've seen a significant uptick in our downloads as a result of you guys doing so. So if you guys don't mind at some point during this podcast, if you are navigating to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, just leave us a five-star review. It really means the world to us. And you know, potentially share this episode with one of your friends or colleagues or anyone else you think would gain some value from it. So uh, again, thank you all so much for your engagement and support. And without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the podcast. Well, hey, Vinny, great to see you this fine afternoon. 
Thank you. Good to see you guys. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Oh, for sure. Yeah. How's the weather over where you're, you're currently located? If you could tell us a little bit about where you're located, I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, sure. So today I'm working out of my home office uh, in uh, Robbinsville, New Jersey, uh, which is close to Princeton, New Jersey, which a lot of people know because of the university uh, and a lot of different people that have come through town over the years, a lot of well-known people. Um, our office is in transition. We signed a lease for moving. So I'm working from home and maybe we'll get into this at some point, but because I have to, not because I necessarily want to, but uh, it's overcast today. It's a little cold, a little rainy, but uh, glad to be getting, you know, heading into spring. That's awesome, man. No, and and I and we will be diving into you know the future of the office market and what's going to look like as well. So we're really excited to do that. But you know, for those of you guys who are listening to the podcast right now, we we actually uh, found Vinny to be a LinkedIn. Uh, he has a pretty strong presence on there. Uh, he's, he does a great job of sharing great content. So you know, I think he's going to be able to provide a significant amount of value to you guys as, as an audience. And so what we typically like to do, Vinny, is when we first meet with someone, we like to learn a little bit, little bit more about them. So if you don't mind, kind of give us a backstory about yourself. I think that'd be awesome. Wow, how far back do you want to go? Um, so to the crib, to the crib. Pr- I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, look, but look, you know, all kidding aside, uh, what makes my job very unique is that I was born and raised in the market that I serve. Uh, I'm a I'm first generation Italian on my father's side. He immigrated to the United States when he was about nine years old, right into Princeton, New Jersey. So my roots are very, very deep here. And um, when I graduated from Rosinus College in 2009, I was really in this place of like, you know, what do I go and do, right? I didn't really know what path I was going to be on. And I'm fortunate that um, I got a call from my brother and he said, hey, you know, I know someone who's uh, looking to hire a couple of junior brokers in this thing called commercial real estate. And I I, I don't really know a whole lot about that, but, you know, I I took a leap of faith, uh, went on the interview, got hired. That was almost 13 years ago this summer. Um, So today I'm with uh, Jones Lang LaSalle. I'm a senior vice president. Uh, I've been with this company a little over three years. I started at Newmark, made my way to Collier's, and now I'm at JLO, which is where I will hopefully be for a long time because, you know, moving uh, is never fun. But uh, I specialize in a, in a sort of a variety of facets, uh, predominantly leasing uh, on both the tenant representations, uh, representation side and the landlord uh, agency side. So I have buildings that I try to lease on behalf of landlords. And I have companies that lease space that want me to help them do a variety of things, uh, renew their lease, move their space, open a new space, expand, sublease, you name it, we do all, you know, all those different things. But then there's a small part of our business as well where we try and do as many sales as we can do. They don't really come up as often uh, as leases do. So we'll sell you know, a building here or there or a con, you know, small office condo. Um, but we have this great group that JLL acquired that used to be called HFF, it's a capital markets group that does strictly sales. So we're trying to partner up with them as much as we can. So, you know, we do, we do a lot, but I think for the audience to understand, you know, I'm an, really an office guy because right, there's multifamily and there's industrial and there's a lot of different things that people do. Um, but I'm in office and really under the umbrella of office, I do medical leasing, I do lab space, you know, R and D things of that nature. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and like yeah. you said, there, there are, there are very, various different facets within the office space. Cause you mentioned medical office and that's going to be completely different requirements than an office user. That's going to have like a call center or, you know, just an, an, a place where they can operate their law firm out of. So I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of nuances there that you've acquired over your experiences, just being in the business for a long period of time. And you also mentioned uh, first generation Italian. I actually was born in Northeast Italy. My mom's Italian. So uh, oh, get out. Italian brother, there you go. Palazzo. Say, Co- no, no, Co- yep. Coyasso. Coyasso is my, uh, my dad's name. He's Puerto Rican, actually. So my mom's Pigozzo. So there, there's, uh, oh. he's from the Fiume Veneto. That's where my mom's from. So, so I, I, I have a ton of family so there. So you're half Italian, half Puerto Rican. Exactly. Yeah. By the way, I, I've, I've got that in my family. I got my aunt Jenny, who's half Puerto Rican, her husband, my uncle Tony, who's Italian. So um, it's a nice mix, very spicy, very just like energetic, right? Uh, I yep. love it. That's awesome, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> I, I kind of want to dive more into the office space sector there, Vinny, with you. And what actually got you interested or pushed you into that sector of commercial real estate? Can you kind of elaborate on that? Or Yeah, sure. So when I joined the Newmark office in Princeton in 2009, um, there were probably five other brokers in the office. And it was it was just office leasing. Nobody there 
uh, did industrial, no, because my office is in Princeton and Princeton is a, um, one of the largest suburban office markets in the state of New Jersey. We have in the greater Princeton region about 26 million square feet of office space, which, which is a lot of space. Wow. Um, we, we are right off of the turnpike, off of the turnpike, we're not that far. And the industrial users typically want to you know, stretch further up along the New Jersey turnpike, which goes up to the ports even closer to New York City. Um, so those brokers tend to want to be uh, situated in offices that are closer to the turnpike so they can you know, get to buildings and show space with their clients much easier. So this particular office that I started out at, everybody was just in office. And so I said, okay, so that's, that's what I'm going to do. And uh, I think, you know, if anybody's paying attention to uh, corporate real estate these days, industrial is just going bananas. And people say, why don't you want to be an industrial broker? Because for the last, if I've been doing this almost 13 years, the last 10 to 11 years, nobody cared about industrial, right? It wasn't a hot sector. So everything is very cyclical. It's the same thing with life sciences, right? We have a, we have a 1.2 million square foot park in our market that was built on spec in the early 2000s with all lab space or shell buildings to be built out as lab. And for years they sat vacant. I'm talking 15 years, just tons of vacancy. Now, all of a sudden they're all leased. So it's the same thing. You know, when I got into business, it was nobody really cared about industrial. Nobody really cared about life sciences. Um, but office will always be really a consistent sector to be in. I mean, it's going to ebb and flow. Um, especially with everything going on with COVID and work from home, you know, if we can survive this, uh, you know, and survive the collapse of 08 and 09, where there were just a ton of availability, tenants were shedding space, put on the market for sublease, um, you know, it just goes to show that there is a consistency. So you might have a big drop here or there, but it's not going to be drastic at the point where you're like, I'm getting out of the, this vertical and I'm going to industrial or I'm going to life sciences or whatever. It'll always just be right there. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. And we've, we've interviewed people from across the country that they're in the office space that kind of feel that, that same way. Uh, they, they, they feel like there will always be a need for office space. And especially because, you know, the, the people who make the decisions pertaining to what, what uh, you know, whether or not they maintain the office is, is the, the, the top, top brass essentially. And they're talking to, they were always saying how, you know, there's a lot of sentiment out there that says it's going to be a grassroot demand for not no longer needing to be in the office space, but really those individuals who are at the top are really going to be the ones dictating it. And if the, the, the president or the CEO is in the office and they want to see their, their, their staff in the office, then that's going to kind of, you know, naturally move into that as well. And, you know, again, I, 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 I similar to you think that, you know, the office market, is, is, is bouncing back through COVID and, and, and it's going to be stronger than ever going forward. So that's awesome. I have some very strong opinions and feelings about work from home that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to share. And anybody that's been uh, paying attention to my LinkedIn, I haven't been so curt on the matter to say, uh, you know, really go over the top, but I've sort of been gentle in this push that we have to get back to the office. Um, look, I'm 35 years old. I have three kids under the age of six. Okay, two of them that are home most of the day, working from home is a nightmare. I love my wife, I love my kids, but right now she's in the basement with the kids and the dog, so nobody makes a peep, right? I mean, it's just not really the, the, the situation that I wanna be in. And I understand that there are people, whether they're the younger millennials uh, or the Gen Zers, or by the way, the baby boomers who are, are, have no kids, the kids that are empty nesters and nobody's home. If you're home alone, whew, working from home is like, probably the sweetest thing. But I have a maybe an older mentality for a younger person that I believe in the climbing the ladder in a professional setting. And when you are not in front of your peers, you're missing out on opportunity. So it's nice to be able to be home, miss out on the commute and the stress of the commute, which a lot of people don't really like. But I think to myself, you are missing out on some of the best collaborative opportunities and growth opportunities of your entire life and professional careers sitting at home will not get you that okay so i think it's just going to take time because you have still if you just look at the traditional decision maker who's maybe somebody in their 50s or 60s who have been in an office setting their entire careers they might have a tough time getting away from that idea of being in the office so they want to pull their people back in but there's a major disconnect between eh, what's really bringing me back into the office right? How do we attract our own people to come back to the office to make them collaborative, to make them creative, and to 
spur growth and success within our own business. And so I think business owners really have to start thinking about the physical environment and what they can do to bring these people back. And, and look, flexibility has actually been one of the best things that have come from this because before COVID, I, look, I, almost, I felt bad for people that would say, you know, I, I can't really go, you know, take my kid to the doctor without, you know, taking an extra sick day and getting doc pay. Like things come up in life and these are the most important things of our life, right? So now that we have the ability to do that, work from home, not miss out on pay, that's a great thing. So I think there's a very, very fine line between just working from home and just working from the office. So I'm all bought in on having that flexible opportunity. But I think anybody that wants to say, I have to just stay home, I hate the office, there's no importance to it. I just think it's this mentality, like almost like a groupthink mentality that like nobody has the um, desire to come out and speak up on it. Like here I am, I'm saying it guys. I, I want your audience to hear it this is not okay. Go to the office, be with your peers, grow and learn and do the things that are going to help you be successful. Oh, for sure. And I think a lot of it just has to do with the fact that people have gotten comfortable in, in that environment, but you know, now that COVID is, is, is hopefully in the rear view mirror and things are starting to get back to normal, it's going to normalize in a couple of years. We have this recency bias, you know, within, within our society where it's like, we just see what's happening today and we think it's going to perpetually be that case. But in reality, my, and similar to your, your opinion, it's going to get back to some semblance of normalcy. And I think there'll always be a hybrid component to it, but to say that the office market is not going to bounce back in a significant way, I think is somewhat naive. So I think that that is, uh, you know, uh, go ahead. Probably. Sorry. It's probably a good way of saying, I was just touching on the word naive. I mean, Mm -hmm. As soon as, as soon as we got through the first few months of COVID and we were trying to wrap our hands around like what this really meant, um, people all of a sudden were putting big blocks of space on the market for sublease. Like, you, why? You, nobody knows what's down, coming down the pike here. And then all of a sudden, a lot of them went, oh, you know what? We actually need that space. Okay, so we kind of put themselves even in a weird spot. So we we're almost too fast to make this very long-term decision to say we're never coming back to the office. Ever is a very, very long time. Um, and we spend too much time focusing on some very big name brands and, and watching what they do. Like when I got into the business, everybody was saying, I want Google space. I want Google space. And really nobody knew what that meant because they would say, oh, can I have a glass wall on my conference room? Right? Like that doesn't make Google office. That gives you a very nice high end look for your conference room, but they didn't really dive into what a Google workplace really meant. Um, my point is that we pay attention to these brands. And so Facebook comes out and they say, we're working from home indefinitely, which by the way, definitely just meant until we figure out what COVID means and when it's safe to get back. But as soon as they made that announcement, they leased 700,000 square feet in Manhattan of, of office expansion. Was it opportunistic, right? You know, because people are gonna start pulling out of their space and rates are gonna go down and Facebook can just meta, excuse me, not Facebook anymore, <laughs> right? Um, so I just think everyone's a little too quick uh, to react and we have to take a little bit of a longer viewpoint of of how COVID has changed the way we look at space. Because by the way, one of the worst side effects of COVID, I should be careful how I say it, one of the side effects is that people are still scared. So you do have a a, you know population of people that don't want to go back to the office because they're scared of getting COVID, whether they have young kids or elderly parents or someone at home who's immune uh, compromised, um, there is a real risk of getting them sick. So we do have to be sensitive to that. And I think that's a totally different topic of conversation, but for those that are willing and able to get, you know, get back to the office and that can, they should. For sure. No, I couldn't agree more. No. So camaraderie in the office is a big, big thing. In my opinion, you can't get that from home through uh, a zoom office thing. And um, that that's huge when it comes to teamwork and stuff in your office. I mean, it almost uh, helps close a deal in my opinion, faster if you're sitting in, in a boardroom across the table and, and you're, and you're trying to get a deal done, uh, but doing it through video from home, I, I just don't see it staying. So I'm with you, both of you guys on that. So, yeah. So, so one of the things I wanted to ask you is, is we're, we're going to go back to somewhat in the beginning of, of your career. Um, some of the people that listen to us as well are, are looking to get into the commercial real estate industry as well. And, you know, as you, as you know, the brokerage business can be quite, um, you know, difficult to get started in. So I don't know if you can talk a little bit about maybe your, your experiences uh, early on and how you were able to overcome some of those early struggles. I think that'd be awesome. 
Man, what a loaded question, right? Because oh um, it, it, it's such a loaded question because it, this, look, it's the only thing I've ever really done in a career, but I would imagine it's one of the hardest. Um, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the people that want uh, fast success. This is the kind of business where you have to come in and you have to work extremely hard for many years without any success, all right? Because then all of a sudden, you're gonna to start to see success and that success is gonna build on itself and build on itself and compound. And then it's gonna go away for a little bit and then it's gonna come back and then you're gonna retool your whole business and your whole way of thinking about things because the way you think about business and, and life and commercial real estate will evolve. And so it's an, it's an ever evolving uh, process and state of mind. But to dial it back, when I was hired, I was told, hey, look, give it three years. You're 22 years old, you're a single guy, you're living at home. You've got nothing to lose. Give it three years. You won't make two cents, but I promise you after three years, if you put in the time, you're going to see the success. So I came in every single morning. Pro look, I, in hindsight, I should have gotten in there even earlier. 8.15 8 or 8 a.m. was not early enough, okay? Um, probably should have been there in there at 7 a.m. And I would you know, urge anybody who's new in the business, if you're single and have the opportunity, be in the office at 7 a.m. Um, I was foot canvassing uh, almost Every single day, you know, typically in the mornings, I would get to the office, get my flyers and go out. I had another young guy who was hired with me, which was really a blessing because I think to do it alone would be really, really difficult. And we would get in the car and look, we would laugh and we would joke and we would knock on doors and we would get to a building and go, okay, you go left, you go right. I got the third floor, you know, you get the first floor, meet in the middle. And uh, it just kept it interesting and it kept it fun. But man, we must have canvassed a thousand buildings a year for the first three years. So we got to know the physical asset of these buildings extremely well, how to get to them really fast. You know, was the lobby nice? Was the parking lot full? Was a piece of junk kind of building? Who were the tenants in there? So we wrote every single tenant name down. We came back to the office and we built our database. The only thing we were handed when we started was a list of all the buildings in the market so we can actually get in the car and go drive them. But we came in and we were given no scripts. Uh, we just said, start calling people. I'm like, well, what do I say? And as a matter of fact, my first cold calls were, uh, and this was, it was, it was a lie, but I said, I'm doing a survey on when tenant leases expire and how much space people have and how many people they employ. I didn't know what else to say. All right. And then it just grew on that. And before I knew it, I had this nice little database of people that I can call on a more regular basis. Um, and, you know, you have these senior brokers are in the office and they're going to throw you little bits here and there. You can do a thousand square feet, you do 1500 feet, and you can just sort of get the experience and really mess up a lot and lose a whole bunch of deals. I mean, I had a deal very early on in my career, and, and I think every young broker should really listen to this, where it was a 2000 square foot lease. Uh, I went to the office, the, they were leasing, I met the guy, he signed the lease, wrote a security deposit check, and he kind of looked around the office like this and he said, um, I don't think this is the space that we're leasing. So what do you mean? The floor plans in the lease, the suite number is referenced in the lease. Yeah, I don't, I don't think this is what my boss wanted. He wanted the one down the hall. So here I am, the lease is signed. The check is signed. We never made the deal. Pour up the lease, pour up the check. We weren't able to make a deal in the space down the hall. And I went back to the office and I, I, I remember where I was sitting. And I probably you know, put my, my face in my hands and I thought, is this the life that I want? To work really, really hard on a deal for months. So really at that time would amount to maybe a few thousand dollars for it to be taken away from me at the last second. That's a really tough situation and something to experience when you're a young broker, but it really helps build your Teflon skin because all these years later, I mean, I care when I lose anything, it all means something to me, but I don't harp on it anymore. You have to go through those failures. Even if, look, that wasn't my fault. I can look in hindsight and still say that there was nothing I did wrong. It was, just a misunderstanding, a miscommunication and whatever. Um, but it was good that it happened because it just, it builds up that experience. And, you know, you're, I, look, I got a call yesterday, simultaneously, I get a call from a broker that we're gonna make a significant lease uh, in a building. Not only is that not happening, at the same time, I get an email that I'm losing the listing on that building. At the exact same time, okay? This is just a natural part of the business. Um, and if you come into it thinking anything else that this is gonna be easy, 
and it's going to be lucrative and people are going to be clamoring to work with you, get out, run away, go find something else to do because you can make a lot of money in this business, but you got to earn it and it's not going to be easy. And sometimes you have a deal ripped away from you. You're going to make a lot of money. And other times as one of the guys I work with likes to call it, you have pennies from heaven. They're like, Oh my God, where did this deal come from? I just made a significant amount of money and it doesn't feel like I did anything, but you did do something. You spend years getting the door slammed in your face, people hanging up on you, people being rude to you, people not caring about the effort that you put in. That will all happen. That is commercial real estate. Okay. There's no way to sugarcoat it. So um, you could almost, you know, look at a person and see their overall demeanor as a young broker in the business. And sometimes I'm like, Oh my God, I wish I can go shake them and say, change now or get out um, because I've seen a lot of people start and fail very quickly. Um, so stay positive, keep a very positive attitude, try not to get down on yourself and just put in the time, learn the material. If you're a broker and you're in, it really doesn't matter if it's retail, industrial office, know the buildings, know the tenants, know the owners, understand what the rents are, Talk to your peers. I mean, you have to know if you've never done a deal, you have to get material from them. You don't have to say, this is a deal that I did. You could say, yeah, the office I work in, we closed a 25,000 square foot lease last year. And here's the comp. And it'll make you sound like you were actually there working on the deal. So in the beginning, you do almost have to fake it to make it. But when you're so young in an industry that you might have no experience in, it's tough to even know what to do. Like I'm telling you all this, only in hindsight, because I went through it. At the time, I wouldn't have known to do any of that. But I think through some, some luck and just, you know, having it in my DNA, being someone who works hard and who's tenacious. And um, by the way, uh, professional, highly professional, although I can be persistent, um, I had those right attributes, which led me to learn these things. So um, be humble, be a hard worker, be kind, and it'll come to you. That's awesome. Great advice, man. And, 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 and sometimes it can be hard to take that perspective when you're in the weeds. And, you know, I've, I've been in the business for about almost three years now. And, and again, I could be, I can say the exact same thing that you're referencing in the first two years. It's, it's a brutal process, man. It is a, you know, a mental grind and you really just got to keep on top of it and educate yourself on a daily basis and continue to put in action towards the ultimate goal that you want to achieve. But you know, if you guys are in that situation, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with what you just said, Vinny. It really is a, it can be a grind, but it's, it's definitely worth it in the long run. Hey, listen, so, I, as a, as a son of an immigrant, I told you, my dad was in the pizza business and I actually had looked at my six-year-old son this morning. He said to me, it's just amazing the things I come up with. He said, dad, when, when did you make your first money? And I, I had this proud dad moment, also like old guy moment where I looked at him and I went, as a matter of fact, your grandfather took me to work when I was your age which is true. I was wiping down tables and pouring sodas for customers. And um, look, it was easy. My dad wasn't like cracking a whip. Um, probably my mom couldn't handle us for the day and say, go to work with your dad. But he put us to work and he taught us the value of what hard work actually means. So I'm not a crotchety old man who thinks, oh, this generation coming up doesn't know how to work. Uh, I think everybody has that in them. But sometimes you have to figure out how to kick it into a different gear because truly nobody is going to do it for you. And look, I probably will upset some people by saying this, but I think there's a lot of the people that are working from home, like I'm working from home and I, I knew I was gonna see you guys, but it was important to me to get up this morning, put my suit on, put gel in my hair, get in my uniform and get that, get that mind right. Because if you're in your sweats, like are, are you feeling good about yourself? Are you feeling confident? You're going to get on the phone and you're going to want to call someone who's going to, you're going to try to convince them to work with you when you're not even convinced of your own self in that very moment. Okay. So it's having that confidence and I don't care if you got to fake it, but fake it the best way you can uh, that you get someone else to believe in, in what you're trying to sell them, which is ourself, right? In this business, I am not saying to you, I, you got to come work with me so I can go bring you to that building. I'm saying, come work with me because I know that you're going to be in good hands. I'm very uh, capable in what I do. I believe in what I do. And I'm not driven by the dollar that's hanging out in front of me. I'm driven by creating a great experience 
for you as my client. So you can go out and tell all your friends that, man, this guy, Vinny, showed me that he cared about me in a way that nobody else has and doing it from a business perspective. He showed that he cared. This is the kind of guy that you got to work with. All we have is our reputation. The more people that I piss off, the harder it's going to be for me to climb the ladder. And this is why I just keep coming back to being kind in what you do. If someone doesn't pick up the phone, the first 20 times you call them, on the 21st time if they pick up, your response isn't, where have you been, man? Like, I can't believe you wouldn't pick up my call. It's, hey, it's so nice to talk to you. Thanks. I'm so glad that I caught you. I mean, that's the mentality. That's how we got to think. That's awesome, man. No, great advice, really. Yeah. I, I know you spoke earlier about that first deal that you thought you had and then the last minute it kind of got ripped away from you. Um, but I want to fast forward a little bit and go to your most recent uh, lease deal on the office space sector. Uh, and was that client expanding into an office or were they decreased in their office footprint? Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So um, I'm in a point right now where I got a whole bunch of deals that have closed at the sort of the same time. Um, the deal cycle is getting longer and longer and longer where, you know, it takes a year to close a lot of these deals. So I got a bunch, but I think the three of the more recent ones have all actually been expansion. Um, so I haven't gotten the green light to share who it is yet, but a very prominent, well-known pharmaceutical company is opening an office in Princeton, New Jersey. They did sign their lease. They're taking 15,000 square feet. They committed to uh, what's almost an 11 year lease. And um, really the value proposition for them was, you know, we've sort of tapped out the market that we're in as far as being able to hire new talent. And we need to find other farmer rich markets in this country that we can, you know, uh, hire people and expand our business lines. So um, one of my colleagues who represents this company, um, you know, reached out and said, we're looking to open an office in Princeton and we know you're a Princeton guy. Can you help us? And that lease was signed about two weeks ago. So it's really, really exciting for the market. Um, you know, the brokers and the owners, a lot of people know about it, know who it is. Um, but uh, I'm excited for when they're able to actually make their announcement because I think it'll make a little bit of a splash. Even though 15,000 feet to a lot of people is not that that big a space, but I think the name um, will will resonate with people and show that, you know, there's a need for office. So, that, so that's one on the pharma side. I've got two law firm clients who are also expanding, really busting out the seams. One's going from about um, 3,000 feet to 7,000 feet, and one went from about 8,000 feet to 11,000 feet. And they're all 10-year leases, um, which is important for me to stay here because, you know, there's still a lot of people who don't have the confidence to make a long-term commitment on a lease. They don't always have to be 10 years, by the way. I mean, it's, it's, it's just really deal-specific. So I don't want your audience to think that, uh, man, if, if, if I need a 10-year lease to get into the space, I'm out. I mean, you can, there's opportunities to do shorter-term leases. But it's important for me to showcase that because um, there are plenty of businesses that are confident and they're looking forward and saying, look, our people are not working from home. Maybe there's a little bit of flexibility, you know, a little bit of that going on. Um, but there's been enough hiring over the last two years that it's made up for whoever's working from home. Like, let's not forget that, right? I want your audience to hear it's been two years since COVID started. So if you have in your organization, 20 people who now work from home on a rotating basis, but over the course of the last two years, you've hired 30, you probably need space, right? There's still growth, there's still momentum. Okay, so you can, you can do the hybrid thing and still need more space today. Um, so um, I hope I answered the question. I mean, those are sort of more than three more uh, recent deals I've closed. Definitely. Oh, well, absolutely. And, yeah. You definitely, yeah. you can't really answer the question. So yeah. Yeah. And I, and I actually had a, a kind of stems a question off of that question pertaining to the length of lease terms that you're starting to see in the marketplace. And part of that is that I've read some, some articles recently that there's been tenant demand for locking in lower lease rates because they're kind of scared, not necessarily scared, but they're, they're, they're cognizant of that inflation is, is ultimately here and it's here to stay for quite some time. Have you been seeing tenants starting to, to demand either longer lease terms for, for, and locking in their lease rates and then maybe the expense stops? Have you seen some, you know, modifications to that as well? Or how have you, how has that been in your market? There aren't a lot of expense stops. It's not something that comes up in the lease every, you know, on the day to day, you know, 
there have been a handful. You put a you put an expense stop on the operating expense increases. If you have a base year, for anybody listening, who understands how these mm-hmm. these gross leases work. So you can have a you can have sort of a cap on what the uh, increase on the controllable expenses are going to be. But I haven't really seen too much of that. Um, you know, again, the office sector is it's not one that jumps so high and goes so low. I happen to be in a very good market. And it's it, for con, for contextual purposes, it's good to, to explain it. I mean, Princeton is situated almost smack in the middle between New York City and Philadelphia. Um, so proximity to these big cities is critical to the success of Princeton. We also have Princeton University and a variety of very high-end, well-known high schools that are prep school, Lawrenceville Prep, Hun, Petty, um, uh, in addition to having Rutgers and uh, very big hospital systems. The Princeton Hospital was recently taken over by Penn. We have Capital Health. I mean, the list goes on and on. So I'm talking about a market that has a very, a very strong foundation. So when I say we don't see these massive jumps in vacancy rates and uh, drops in rental rates, it's because of the foundation that we have. There are plenty of office markets that have been crushed, right? Because they're just not that exciting of a place to be in in, in, in the first place. Um, but because we're very consistent, we, we, the rents just say to this, little, little jump here, little dip there. If it's premier class A space, we have seen growth over the last five or six years. There's been maybe 15 or 20% growth in those rents. But anything that's sort of in the middle range, class B, lower class A spaces, they stayed the same. So uh, I'm explaining all that because tenants aren't really stepping up saying, I got to lock these, these rates in. They're going to be the same 10 years from now, just like they were the same 10 years ago. Um, what's really important is that, look, if you're in a lease that was 10, you signed 10 years ago, what's happening is if it started at 25 bucks a foot and it's escalated 50 cents a foot for 10 years, you, you know, you're at 30 bucks a foot. Hopefully I did that math right. No one's fact checking mm-hmm. me. Um, and now that that lease has expired, you are overpaying because the market did not rise along with the rate in your lease. So you hire a guy like me to come in and tell you that, that you are now overpaying for the lease. You weren't when you signed it, but now you are. Let's work together. Let's figure out a way to get to the landlord if you want to stay to say, look, we got we got to drop this rate um, and bring it back down to earth. So I think there are plenty of options for tenants right now to find a way to feel as if they're taking advantage of what might be a softer market. And even though Princeton has this really strong and great foundation, it, it, it's still a, land, uh, a tenant market. Landlords are still going to want to step up and be aggressive to make deals. So if anything, you know, I'm probably seeing you know, an extra 50 cents a foot to a dollar a foot in wiggle room on rent. Uh, another month or two of free rent, depending on the term of the lease. Um, you know, another five or 10 bucks a foot in tenant improvement dollars. That's the way that landlords are trying to really go out and win deals. And whether it's a new deal or keeping a tenant and having them renew or expand their existing building. So plenty of ways for tenants to try and step up, you know, in this, let's just call it post COVID era to try and take advantage of, you know, the situation. Makes sense. No, that's some great advice. So one of the things I wanted to to, to kind of reference in this podcast is what uh, the reason why we were able to, to get in contact with you is, was via your LinkedIn presence. And so one of the things we like to talk about uh, is is the the digital evolution that's occurred over the last decade or so, uh, where, where we're starting to see a lot more people having a stronger digital footprint, and it's becoming a bigger part of you know, the brokerage end as well. So I was kind of curious if you could talk a little bit about maybe the impact that you've seen through your efforts on LinkedIn and, you know, both on the business end and maybe even on the personal development end as well, or personal branding bit end, I should say. Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I look at my, my career in three different, uh, th- uh, excuse me, through three different lenses. My, my starting point at Newmark, going to Collier's and then being at JLL. When I was at Newmark in 2009, I mean, so much has changed in, in, in digital experience and with uh, social media between just 2009 and today. So I don't even think I had a LinkedIn um, profile until I went to Collier's in 2011. I just don't remember getting on the computer, logging into my LinkedIn in the morning. I definitely didn't have Twitter. Uh, wasn't, it wasn't even, I think maybe it was like an 07 uh, creation, right? But like in 09, I didn't, I didn't even know about it. So uh so about 2011, 2012, I said, I really got to get on here and I really got to start poking around. And I saw a broker by the name of Coy Davidson, who's still at Collier's, and he was a very early adapter to social media and to blogging. And he was crushing it. And he got in early enough that he was able to really capture the audience, and, but not the, just the audience, the opportunity, ways to 
uh, generate income from being on social media. And I would repost his articles. And, and one day it just kind of hit me and I thought, I'm posting his article, someone's clicking on it. They get to the bottom of the article. They have forgotten about me, the person who posted it, because they just saw the guy's name on the bottom. Went, wow, Koi just had a lot of really cool things to say. And I like Koi, he's a great guy. I'm happy to support him, which is why I'm saying his name. But at the end of the day, I was like, I gotta support Vinny DiMeglio and not him. Um, so I had a trip out to Santa Barbara, California for a friend's wedding, flew into LAX with my wife, and we had a two hour uh, bus ride going up to Santa Barbara. And um, I said, I'm gonna start writing blogs. I brought some pen and paper and I wrote my first two or three blogs because I wanted to have something like you write the first one and then you're like, wait, where's the second one? I knew I wanted to have a few to back it up. Um, and I wrote so many within the first few years, I kind of tapped myself out. I mean, I think I wrote 65 blogs. Um, so I have a nice archive of, of information. But what has come from all of it is sort of the opposite of what I had anticipated. I had this idea that I was going to start putting myself out there and tenants were going to call me and say, I need 10,000 feet. I need 20,000 feet. Can you help me? It's this. It's meeting guys and gals, you know, who want me on a podcast, uh, who want me to, you know, speak at one of their events, who, uh, uh, you know, ask me to be in a networking meeting, you know, and from those opportunities, I have met other people, which has led to business. And I think just deep down in people's subconscious, they, they know that Vinny's a guy who's got a presence and he's in commercial real estate, but they don't know that they found me on LinkedIn, right? But they're, they're telling somebody, this is a guy you got to go reach out to. So I think there has been an extreme benefit to it. It's tough to put a dollar amount. I can't say that being on LinkedIn has generated X amount of dollars in revenue for me. Um, that's almost impossible to know, other than a couple of people who have reached out to me, right? And said, you know, um, like I have a guy who I met at the gym, forgot that I even met him. He must, I must have said hello. He found me on LinkedIn, and that was that. Three years later, I get a message from him Hey, Vinny. Um, been seeing your post. I understand your commercial real estate broker. My firm needs space. I mean, that that deal alone has generated $150,000 in commission. So there has been benefit to it, but you want to be able to quantify it in more than just one deal. Sure. Um, but it's been a lot of fun, guys. Um, I think it takes a lot of work. It adds another layer of my responsibilities for the day, you know, I want to make my cold calls, I want to get to my emails, but I want to get to my social media and I want to create my posts and I want to make sure that people are seeing me and, um, you know, so building on that momentum. I haven't figured out the LinkedIn algorithm if you guys know anything about it. Um, because some days I put out a just an awesome post. I'm like, I'm going to generate so many hits and I get nothing. And then the things I put out that I'm just like, this is so weak, I'll get, a, you know, 2000 views. Like what is going on? So um, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. Definitely. No, have you noticed, cause this is something that I've noticed is that sometimes, and, and obviously in, in tandem with your out outreach efforts where I've, I've had a, you know, a left a voicemail for someone that I'm reaching out to. And then later on, they Google me or something like that. And they find, you know, my LinkedIn profile, I've written a couple books and stuff, and they just so happen to research it. And when I meet them or interact with them or call them on another time, like the conversation is different. I don't know if you've ever noticed that at all, or have you, have you, have you seen that? I don't think anybody's called me and said, I, I Googled you and found your LinkedIn. But what I try to do is I try to uh, steer people there because what I've tried to do on my page is make it um, uh, sort of a library of my success, which by the way, plenty of failures. I'm not trying to say that there's, I don't know how to showcase a failure. So it's easier just to, Hey, here's, I ask people for testimonials. I go, hey, did you have a good experience working with me? Yeah, I did. Would you mind writing a few words? You know, can you please, you know, you send a testimonial request out on LinkedIn or a recommendation request on LinkedIn. So I have a library of whatever it is now, 25 or 30 of those. It's one of the most proud components of my business is getting positive feedback from clients. It truly makes me very happy um, because what people need to realize is that like I'm a high volume broker, in my opinion. Um, that means that I close about 40, 45 deals in a year. But what does that mean? That means I'm not even, I don't even have that feeling of success even once a week in a year, right? I've always said to people, the business like my dad was in serving pizza was one of the most fun experiences that I could have ever been in because you have a long uh, lunch rush 
and you're slinging slices and sodas and salads and boom, boom, boom. And every time that register rings, you get that feeling of success, right? It just triggers that euphoria. Like, yes, yes, I'm doing it. In this business, almost every day, almost every day, feeling of no success, okay? So I wanna highlight it on my page. I wanna show people that, you know, I have people that have had a good experience with me, go to the LinkedIn, check it out. If I've been written up in an article, if I wrote a blog, it's all there. Create, create a place for people to go to see that you've done some good things. So that's what I, I've tried. Instead of them maybe finding me there, I try to steer them there just to answer the question. That makes sense. Awesome. And I mean, that, that's awesome. I, I like your approach on that for you, where you can, you know, kind of funnel them to that LinkedIn. And once they get there, you're, you're definitely showcasing what you've done and what you can do for them. So I, I get this often. In, in my line of work, and uh, it is actually about office space uh, and what changes and trends are like coming down the pipeline uh, in the anticipation of actually getting the workforce back into the office. Uh, what have you seen like in your particular area? You know, it's really interesting. I, there's so much written about this exact topic. I think the day-to-day -day companies, they're not really doing all that much. It's, it's not easy to turn on a dime and say, we've got to now spend the capital to create a space that people are going to want to come back to. If you're just like a one-off company, and I don't mean that in a mean way, you're not a Google or a Facebook or an Apple that has a treasure trove of cash, do whatever the heck you want to do with it. You can just like, let's just blow out the space, right? I mean, construction costs are through the roof right now, right? And um, you're just like, look, we'll just, whatever, like, we'll just be a good place to work, but I can't necessarily create, um, you know, this uh, really cool over the top place that you want to be at. So I think um, for those that do have that opportunity, they're focused on really this um, uh, over the top amenity package, depending if you're in, uh, you know, more of a uh, urban or suburban setting, um, you know, people talk about these rooftop bars or these uh, outdoor patios, these covered areas. I mean, your traditional suburban building for the last decade, the conversation has been about, do you have a cafeteria and do you have a fitness center? Um, that's not enough anymore. You know, conference centers, same thing. It's like, you know, my people are going to come back. Do they feel like the health and wellness of the building is up to a, a standard of 2022? Um, so, you know, it's not, not just about having the fitness center. Uh, do you have, uh, you know, a walking trail? Do you have healthy food alternatives? Um, is your building a lead building? So we know that, you know, it truly is a healthy place to work. Has the HVAC been updated? Which again, to that point, you know, tenants that got upset during COVID to say, well, your HVAC systems are not really up to code. Like, wait a second, you expect me as a landlord to just spend a million dollars to, to like replace my HVAC? It's not that easy. Um, just like it's not easy for your day-to-day -day company to go spend 50 or 60 bucks a foot to retrofit their space. So, um, you know, I have some clients that are trying to take some unused space uh, within their space and maybe creating some additional small meeting rooms, uh, fitting it out with some, you know, better tech. So if people do want to do more of the weather, by the way, whether it's podcasts, whether it's uh, virtual blogs, uh, or whether it's having video calls, you know, having a room or two dedicated just to that. Um, so I, there really is a plethora of things that are people are trying to do to capture this, you know, change in dynamic in the workforce. But I, I think it's still so early on, which is crazy to say, because we've been at this for two years, but most people still don't know what they want to do. So I think to ask that question a year from now, we'll be able to shed a little bit more light on here's what people did. Uh, but now it's really just talking about like, you know, what are they thinking? Like our office, we will have no private offices. Um, it's a small local office, but if we have this focus on uh, a central uh, kitchen as a, as a spot to collaborate, smaller meeting rooms so you can take your calls, do things like this, uh, a breakout area, breakout table, like high top table to be, you know, to go and have a presentation or to have, a, you know, a last minute meeting. Those are the things that we're focusing on more than having the closed off private rooms, but that's what's important to us. 
Definitely. No, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think, you know, like you said, as, as you know, we start getting back to some semblance of normalcy as it pertains to, you know, people getting back, you, you'll, you'll start seeing, you know, the, the discussions from the tenants and the landlords start to e- to equalize. Cause I'm sure, you know, you probably have to deal, especially initially with people coming back to the office, people were probably, the tenants were probably, their expectations were probably way out of line with what a lot of the landlords were w- willing to do. And hopefully over time, you guys get to an equilibrium point where it's like, okay, now we're, we're back to some semblance of realism as far as getting, getting you guys into space. And so I think it's part of that, I'm sure is setting expectations for people as to what that's going to look like uh, going forward. So that's awesome, man. We're without a doubt. Yeah. So, you know, near the end of the podcast episode, and first off, we, we just were really thankful for all the, the insights you provided to, to the audience. I know we've gained a lot of value from it. One thing we love to do is to ask our guests to provide us with one of the most impactful books they've ever read. And the reason for this is that, you know, our audience are all voracious readers. I know I read a ton. Jeff is, is big into that as well. So if you could kind of share maybe one uh, book that really was just impactful for you, and it doesn't necessarily have to be real estate related. It can be, you know, any type of book it would be awesome. I'm looking up at my library of books here, trying to figure out, you know, what's, uh, what's one that really resonated with me. Uh, to be truthful, when I turned 30, I, I, set out sort of a mission to become uh, a reader. And it was really important to me to start picking up books. And I, you know, self-help books are good. Um, yeah, real estate books are boring. They're dry. There's really not a whole lot you really can glean from there. But I started reading biographies. Uh, I wanted to learn what some of the other greats have done. And the, I'm going to tell you the one that I started with because it really set me on my mission of reading. And it was um, Walt Disney's biography. I'm a big Walt Disney fan, Um, the history, the company, and just the day-to-day, my wife, myself, my kids, we love going to the parks. But But it was learning about him as a businessman and the obstacles that he went through, the failures that he had to ultimately become the person that he is and the way that he reinvented himself through many a tough time, I just found it to be super, super fascinating. And that led me to read other biographies. So Walter Isaacson is a great biographer. He didn't write the uh, Disney biography, uh, but he wrote one on Steve Jobs, Ben Franklin, Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, these are uh, Einstein. Uh, I read all of them and they all really, I'm not going to say they changed my life, but they really shaped my thinking um, because it you know, I'm not setting out to be those guys necessarily. That's a pretty high bar to set. But I think if you can, you know, imagine yourself in their footsteps and, um, you know, understand that we're all the same. We all come from the same place. We're just human beings. um, But we all have the opportunity and ability to be great in our own special way. Then you can set out and do a lot more than you ever thought you could accomplish. And that's the kind of um, impact I was trying to glean from these books. And so um, I think more important than saying, go read this book, it's just go pick up a book, go read and make sure when you're done with that book, read another one. doesn't matter what it is. Keep going. Awesome. Yeah, no, we, we, we continually say it. Uh, you know, it's, it's about creating or impacting your decision-making framework, right? Because the more information that you glean and, and insights that you generate through reading these books it helps impact how your decision-making process works. So going forward, you should be able to make better decisions, whether that's in your personal life or professional life and whatever else. And I, I mean, I love the fact that you mentioned biographies because I'm a big reader of biographies as well. And, you know, I haven't read the Walt Disney book, but I've read all the Walter Eisenson books. I've read a lot of the books for, you know, Shoe Dog, uh, The Ride of a Lifetime by Bob, yeah, Bob so Iger. Yep, yep. Phenomenal book. Oh, the Iger one's great. Yep, <clears throat> yeah, yep, they're, all, yep. they're all phenomenal books. And so you get to really peek in the, the, the door of these individuals who are super high performers. And again, they all, the, the great thing that, that you glean from these experiences too, is that they all went through very difficult times. I mean, the, you never see or read most, most biographies where, you know, it's just like a, a straight ride to the top. It, it is very much a roller coaster up until they get to where they are at. And even when they get to where they're at, there's obstacles and, and things they have to deal with in order to really ultimately achieve what they're, they're trying to accomplish. And so, you know, I think that, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, then they die. Then they die. You read with Steve Steve Jobs and Walt Disney and a lot of these guys, 
I'm really, I was just trying to be a little bit funny, but uh, you're right, man. It's, it's such a roller coaster, and, and, you know, to put a bow on it, it's the best way to describe uh, being a commercial real estate broker. Mm -hmm. It is a roller coaster. Okay. It's, it's every single day up and down and it's got a way of taking you from the highest highs and bringing you to the lowest lows. And that's not to scare anybody. That's just to be truthful. And I, and I think you, like, you have to find the joy in the every day. I mean, I truly enjoy getting on LinkedIn and, and creating a post. I enjoy making my cold calls, even though it's not really fun. I enjoy the process because when I close my book, proverbial book at the end of the day, I have a, a feeling of fulfillment and that even though maybe I didn't close a deal today, I know that I took the steps to do what I need to do to close a deal tomorrow or next week or next month or next year, because you do continually have to keep building it. So um, I will give you a quote from a book that I read, which resonates with me deeply that, that really connects with everything that we're saying. I might butcher which book it was from. I think it's Steve Covey. Um, you must first seek to understand before you can seek to be understood. We are far too complacent with wanting to get our point out. Nobody's listening. Every time you're talking to somebody, they're just thinking about what they want to say next. Okay, and I'm not perfect at that. By the way, I am far from perfect. But if you're listening right now and you can find the ability to shut off your thinking about what you want to say next and just really focus on what the person is saying to you, once you have the chance to, to, to say something, like your thoughts are going to be so much more well refined rather than just spewing out what you knew you wanted to say 30 seconds ago. So seek to understand before you can be understood. Great insights, really. Vinny, I just want to start saying as we round off here, I uh, appreciate you coming on. Like uh, Raphael said, you did give us lots of value. I know our listeners will agree. Um, we have a CRE treasure chest, which is a repository of things that we like to ask our uh, uh, people that come on the podcast to give to us so we can give out free to the listeners. Um, it can be a PDF. It could be a blog post. Um, anything that's pertaining to your uh, sector, commercial real estate, we try to uh, give to our listeners for free. Um, so our ask today is, what are you willing to contribute? Free, guys. I didn't know I'd have to give anything for free. Um, kidding. Um, I have, uh, as I mentioned before, I have a nice library of blog posts. So I'm going to go find the perfect blog for your audience. I'll send you that link. And, um, you know, look, I appreciate you saying you appreciate me. I appreciate you guys. Um, this came out of nowhere, which is how these things happen. So I'm really glad that I said yes and had a chance to meet you guys and any of your listeners that want to connect with me on um, really anything. Just, you know, hey, I want to get into commercial real estate. Uh, you, a couple of things you said resonated with me. Like whatever the case is, they're more than welcome to reach out to me and I'm happy to help. That's awesome. No, and, and like like we mentioned before, we actually include all, all of your contact information in the description. So if you guys are watching this on YouTube, feel free to go to the description and check it out. We'll have, you know, all the contact information, put his LinkedIn as well. So you guys can add him as well. If you guys are listening to in the podcast format, you guys can go ahead and do that as well. It's going to be in the description so you guys can get access to it. So again, Vinny, we greatly appreciate your time. If you guys are watching this on a pod or listening to this in a podcast format, like an Apple podcast, Spotify, we would greatly appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review. We've seen a significant uptick in our downloads as a result of you guys engaging with the podcast. It really has been impressive the last, you know, two or three months that we've seen the, 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 the uptick. And if you guys are watching this on YouTube, feel free to like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm and ensures more and more people can hear this message and learn about the many facets of commercial real estate. So thanks again for tuning in, guys, and we'll see you all next time.